Luke chapter 8, verses 41, 42. And we're going to drop down to verse 49 to verse 56. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was the ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet, and he begged him to come to his house. For he had, he had a, his only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. Let's skip down uh, to verse 49. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house, saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him, saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will, she will be made well. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not, he as in Jesus said, do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, him as in Jesus, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, called saying, little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Amen. And so today I want to use as a subject men of faith. Men of faith. And brothers, it's one thing that I noticed that brothers are good at a lot of things. But oftentimes when it comes to our faith, sometimes, sometimes, we become a little lack. And so what is this thing we call faith? Faith is to have confidence in a person or a thing. Faith is to put trust in a person or a thing. And I, I, I like to say for a Christian man, you often put your confidence in God. You often put your Trust in God. But oftentimes I've discovered that brothers, sometimes we can be guilty of putting our confidence, putting our trust, putting our faith in everything else but God. I, I would say that oftentimes, brothers, if we're not careful, we're putting our faith in the wrong thing. Men oftentimes are guilty of putting their faith in their position. I'm in charge of this. I command this. I'm responsible for this. And oftentimes they get so caught up in their position, they forget about their God. Brothers can sometimes get real hung up and put their faith in their physical selves. I'm, I'm strong, I can lift this. I'm fast, I can outrun that. I look so good that I can't stay out of the mirror. And so every now and then, brothers, if we're not careful, we're putting our faith in our physical selves. But then, that ain't all. Sometimes, brothers, if we're not careful, we put our confidence, our faith, our trust in our financial sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brothers like to brag about how much money they make. They like to brag about how much land they own or how big their house is. And if you're not careful, you'll find a brother bragging about what kind of car he drives. And if, and, if, and if that's not enough, some brothers like to dress real good, and so they like to brag about the clothes that they wear. But brothers, I just want to be real with you today. Those superficial things, those superficial things really don't last. I, I got some witnesses. If you, if you think that they're last, I want you to go ask the brother who lost his job. The one who now is not in charge of anything, but 
his unemployment check. Yeah, yeah, he used to be over this, in charge of that. I got some more witnesses, so I want you to go ask that brother who can't physically do what he used to do. You know, the one that used to run so fast, but now he can't do nothing but walk. And then really, I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to keep it real. You can ask some wives about some of these brothers who can't do what they used to do. I'm making this point because we get so caught up in our physical self, who we are as a man. And we put all our faith in that. And brothers, let's be honest, all of you handsome, curly hair, curly top brothers, I, I, I'll tell you that, uh, I'll tell you that, uh, uh, if you think that's going to last, <laughs>
that he needed to humble himself before God. The Bible said he, 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 he fell down to Jesus' feet. He, he begged Jesus to come to his house. He humbled himself before the Lord. But brothers, can I tell you something? It doesn't really matter if you're a leader, you still can humble yourself before God. Amen. Amen. It, it doesn't matter, brothers. Just because you're a male doesn't mean that you can't humble yourself before God. Brothers, I, I know we got some husbands in the house, and, and sometimes husbands think they got to be the toughest guy in the house. But let me tell you something. You get tougher the more humbler you get before the God. See, when you lie down before God, you look stronger to your wife. So you think, because you put your chest out. Yeah, 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 that, that, that makes you stronger. But in actuality, the humility that it takes for a man to bow down and talk to a most powerful God, that's what makes you stronger. Listen, 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 listen. You fathers out there who think you got to bully your children to get them to get what, do what you want? No, 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 no. You don't have to bully your children to get them to do what you want. All you got to do is show them that you're a man of God. And they respect the God in you more than they respect the bully in you. Let, let me say that again because in case somebody missed it, they will respect the God in you a whole lot more than they will respect the bully in you. And so let us understand, brothers, we're more of a man if we humble ourselves. The Bible says in Numbers 12 and 3 that Moses was humble, and the text says he's more, he was more humble than all the men on the earth. Now we know Moses was a leader. You know he led thousands of people. If Moses can humble himself, surely, brothers, we can humble ourselves. The Bible says in Psalms 9 and 12 that God does not forget the cry of the humble. It says now in Psalms 18, it says God saves the humble, but he brings down the haughty. What that means to me is that if you want to be arrogant, if you want to have your nose in the air, just remember now, when God sees that, his sole intention for you is he's going to bring you down. But if you humble yourself, if you humble yourself, he, 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 he brings you up, he saves you. And in fact, I believe he saves you from yourself. Yeah, yeah, because it's that arrogance that makes you make a mess of yourself. And in fact,
Jairus went to Jesus on behalf of his 12-year-old daughter who was dying. He didn't go there for himself. He went there for his family. Because in another place in the text, the mother was there. So that tells me Jairus was a family man. So he went to Jesus for his daughter. Think about this. Jairus was a man of influence. He was a man of affluence. And he was a man of power. So in other words, he had connections. He had money. And he had a daughter. But he took his daughter to Jesus. Listen, this brother could afford any doctor that he wanted. He could have took his daughter to any medical facility that was available. The man could have told somebody else to come take his daughter to the doctor. But he didn't do that. He went to Jesus himself on behalf of his daughter. In other words, he looked out for his family. And the only thing I could say is that he went to Jesus because he wanted his daughter and his wife to understand where all their help come from. And so brothers, what does that mean to you? It means then, if you want your wife and your children to follow you spiritually, then you have to let them see you going to God on their behalf. Look, 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 look. They know you're making a paycheck. They see that. They know you're buying groceries because you bring that in. They, they, they know maybe you're paying for the car because, you know, you're paying the note. But, but you need to let them see you going to God on their behalf. And the only way I really, you know, they can really see that is they got to see you praying. They got to hear you praying. They got to see you read the scripture. They got to see you teaching them scripture. So in other words, you need to take responsibility for the spiritual well-being of your whole family. Men of faith. Here this brother is, and, and let, me, let, me, let me say this. Sometimes, brothers, we get so high and mighty that all we want to do is talk about what we're doing. I'm going to get you to just sit right here. I'm buying this. I'm taking care of this. I'm taking you here. I'm doing this for you. But what you really need to be saying is let's sit down and share this scripture. Let's sit down and have a prayer. Let's sit down and get God in the midst of this so we can have a good marriage, so we can have a good family. See, the problem, brothers, is that we're not spiritually leading our families. We're paying our way. But you can't pay your way to God. You got to pray your way. You got to teach your way. You got to fast your way. You can't just pay your way. And so you got to lead your family in their spiritual life. And so the next thing then, let me hurry, hurry, hurry. Let me hurry. Brothers, let me just say this. If you want your family to be healed, you got to do it spiritually. If you want them to be whole, you got to do it spiritually. If you want them to be healed, if you want them to be whole, if you want them to be strong, if you want them to be successful, if you want them to respect you, you have to be the leader of your house. Spiritually. Yeah, 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 I know you're making a paycheck, that's good. But you got to make the spiritual well-being of your family your top priority. And in fact, I, I believe this. If you make the spiritual well-being of your family top priority, you don't have to worry about the rest of the stuff. Because God's going to handle that. It, it, it's, it's, it's that. It's, it's that connection that you make with him for them. He's going to take care of you. He's going to take care of them. And he's going to take care of everything else. But you need to be the lead man. I often see people, they, they take care of their soldiers really well. But 
they don't take care of their family, well, flip. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you, brother, so I know nobody here is guilty of that, but if you have some soldiers that's guilty of that, just let them know. That it's their spiritual, it's their spiritual, it's their spiritual growth that you must say is the most important thing. Men of faith. My third point, I'm almost done, is that if you're going to be a man of faith, you must keep your faith no matter what the circumstances are. Amen. It's in the text. I skipped this part, but verses 43 through 49, Jesus stopped to take care of the woman with the issue of blood. Now, Jairus was leading Jesus. So, so, so in other words, Jesus was following him to his house, right? And he was going, and everything looked good, because every time he turned around, Jesus was right there. They were headed on to see him by the door. But when he, but when he, but when he looked back this time, Jesus was stopped taking care of this woman. We all know the story of the woman with the issue of blood. Now, I don't know how long that took, but a lot happened during that time. So Jairus looked back. Jesus doesn't stop. He's taking care of this woman. But Jairus stayed right there. In fact, he just ran off and said, forget about this guy. He's not coming to help me. But he kept his faith in Jesus no matter what. But then there was a, there was a second point in the text where Jairus could have gave up. Because you remember the text, when the, when the person came from his house, he said, sorry, Jairus, your God is already dead. And he said, but he, but he stayed right there with Jesus. Look, 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 look. In those two instances, Jairus could have given up. He, he could have thrown in the towel. He could have said, what's the news? He could have lost hope. He could have said, my daughter is dead now. Forget about you, Jesus. His circumstances were not good. And in fact, and if someone who said to me, she's already dead, I, I would have thought, what's the use of keep going? What's the use of going home? The reason I was going home because my daughter was sick. But now she's dead. And Jesus, you done left me hanging. You done hung out with this sick woman with the issue of blood and let my, let my daughter die. But Jerry said, no, no, no. I'm going to stick with Jesus. I don't care what my circumstances are. I don't care what's going wrong. I'm going to stick with Jesus. And I like that because he stayed right there with Jesus and Jesus being reassured him. He said right there in the text. He said, Jairus, don't be afraid. All you got to do is believe. And she will be made well. Jairus, I know I spent too much time with that woman with the issue of blood and I let your daughter die. But don't be afraid. You just believe. Jairus, I know you want to quit. I know you want to throw in the towel. But if you just stick with me, she will be made well. Brothers, let me come find you. Because see, it don't matter if your job is not working right right now. You just stick with Jesus. It, listen, it don't matter if your wife not treating you real good right now. You just stick with Jesus. It don't matter if the kids are cutting the food right now. You just stick with Jesus. Because see, in spite of your circumstances, Jesus is really saying to you, just like he said to Jerry, don't be afraid. Just believe in God. And he'll make everything all right. You have to understand, no matter what your circumstances are, you got to stick with Jesus. Because that's the only answer that you have. I know the circumstances sometimes get hard. I know sometimes the circumstances get dark. I know the circumstances get to the place that you want to quit. But I'm telling you, if you just stick with Jesus. Listen, if you stick with Jesus, just like this brother here in the text, Jesus will make everything all right. I, I know I got some witnesses. I know I got some witnesses. I, I know some people that have been through some stuff and they stuck 
with Jesus. They could see the end. They didn't know what the end was going to be, but they stuck with Jesus. Don't let your circumstances, brother, deter you, turn you back, stop you, hold you up. Stick with Jesus. Stick right there. And I'm going to my last point. If you're going to be a man of faith, and this is a big one, brothers. This is a big one. If you're going to be a man of faith, you got to associate with people of faith. When you look at this text, there was two crowds. That's right. In verse 51, there was a crowd. When Jesus got in the house, he said, now, the only people who can come in here is Peter, James, John, and the girl's parents. Them are the only ones who can come in here. But then there was another crowd. Now here, you have to understand this crowd. You have to really understand about this crowd. So the crowd in, in verse 52 was really the wrong crowd. That was the crowd that was weeping and mourning. Yeah, and Jesus said to them now, think about this. They were weeping and mourning, and Jesus said, don't weep. She's not dead. But what did they say? They laughed at Jesus. They ridiculed Jesus. He said, now what? Jesus? This girl dead. She ain't sleeping. That's the wrong cry. That's a negative cry. That's a naysaying cry. The, the, those are the people without faith. So, so if you're going to be hanging out with a crowd, if you're going to be associated with some folks, you got to associate with people who have some faith. you gotta, you got to get rid of that negative crowd. If you look, listen, 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 if you look at the text, the Bible said Jesus put them outside. He, get on out of here. And, and once he put them outside, once he put the negative crowd outside, you know what he said? Grab his girl hand. He grabbed a hand. He grabbed him out of hand. But he couldn't work the miracle, though, until the negative crowd was out door. Then he says, Jesus said, little girl, arise. And the Bible said, her spirit returned to her immediately she arose. But it wasn't until the right crowd was in the house. See, the wrong crowd and, and, and the way I see it, stifles the spirit. The, the wrong crowd stifles the spirit. But the right crowd allowed the spirit to flow. And healing took place. And you know, I thought, thought about that, brothers. That's a mighty good word for some brothers in here today. That's a mighty good word. Because you've been asking God for some blessings. And you've been asking God for deliverance. And you've been asking God for some answers. And you've been asking God for some miracles. But all you really have to do, brothers, is get rid of that negative cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you need to change the company that you're keeping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because see, when he got rid of that negative cry, he said, rise up. Rise up. Rise up. And brothers, I'm thinking about you. Because see, when you get rid of that negative cry, you're going to be able to rise up. Yeah, you're going to be able to rise up. You'll be able to rise up, and you will be able to take your life back. You'll be able to rise up and take your family back. You'll be able to rise up and take your church back. You'll be able to rise up and take your community back. You'll be able to rise up and take your spirit back. You'll be able to rise up and take your faith back. You see, brothers, you got to get out of that negative crowd, because if you don't get rid of them, you're not going to rise up. You're going to go down. So let's get rid of that negative crowd. Get rid of that bad company. Get rid of those people who are holding you back. Brothers, we got to be men of faith. Men who rely on Jesus Christ for all that we need. Listen, your wife is dependent on you. Your children are dependent on you. 
Your church is dependent on you. Your community is dependent on you. Your extended family is dependent on you. You must begin to live your life as a man of faith. Get rid of all this nonsense. It doesn't really matter at all. It's your faith in God. It's your trust in God. It's your confidence in God that will lead you to a place that's overflowing with blessings. That's overflowing with joy. That's overflowing with peace. With overflowing with deliverance from all these things. Look, I know we've been through hell and back. I got it. But what I also know if we put our faith in God, if we put our hands in the hands of the one who can take us out of it, we can be men of faith. We can be men when our families look at us and say, there he goes. He finally stood up. He finally let that nonsense go. Brothers, we have such responsibility. It breaks my heart. Every time I hear about a brother who's not doing the right thing, and I know, I know the pull out there, brothers. I understand it. I ain't always stood right here. I got it. And even standing right here, it still pulls. But what I'm trying to say to you is that you must let it go. Stand up and be the kind of man that God is calling you to be. Stand up and be the kind of man that when you face God, you don't have to make no excuses. Stand up and be the kind of man that your sons and your daughters want to emulate. I want you to ask this question of yourself. If my daughter marries me, if my daughter marries me, would I want her to marry me? I want you to think about that, brothers. Because So we want to tell them who to go out with. We want to tell them who to date. We want to tell them who to marry. But who was the first person that they saw? Well, who was the first man that they got their example from? It's you. And so let us make ourselves in such a way that if our daughter was to marry us, we say, come on, honey. We married a good man. If you're not that kind of man, right. it's time to get yourself together. Amen. Listen, brothers. I tell you, as a man, and as I'm getting older, my views about oh. wife has changed. Oh, that's right. That's right. Now, 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 once I was young, I didn't know much better. If I, if I could get that back, I would, but I can't. But what I do know is that when I go forward, I can do the right thing. And what I do know about you, when you go forward, you can do the right thing. You can be a man that takes care of his family. You can be a man who makes his family proud. You can be a man who serves God in such a way. Listen, let me say something. When Jesus went to the cross, we always got to go by the cross because we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the cross. That's, that's why we're here with Christians who come to the cross. But when Jesus went to that cross, he understood. He understood that we get wobbly sometimes. He understood that we make some mistakes sometimes. He understood that we would sin sometimes. And so, he went to the cross and died such a brutal death. Such a horrific death. So that you and I 